Well, if you have your Bibles with you this evening, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Ruth. We're going to continue and actually wrap up chapter 1 here this evening. And there are some wonderful truths to glean therein. The book of Ruth, chapter 1. And I'll be reading from verse 6 for context through the end of the chapter. Let's go before our great God in prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this very book and the truths are, that are contained therein. We thank you, Lord, uh, what, for what they point us to and who they point us to, that being our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, we thank you for the great story um, and other helpful lessons that are there. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would um, help us to hear and to see these things that your spirit would write them in our hearts and help us to keep them and follow you all the days of our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Ruth chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, hear now the very word of God. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. And therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her, her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Na Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Amen. Thus far the reading of God's word. Well, beloved in Christ, relapse, judgment, repentance, and rescue. This is the cycle that we as God's people find ourselves in as we walk through this life. And though we know what God calls and commands us to do in obedience to him, 
we often give in to temptation and fall into sin. As was true for those in the days of Ruth, we too experience temporal judgments and chastening from God's hand. He lovingly brings us to repentance through the discipline and difficulty we endure. And God then delivers. He brings rescue in ways that only he can. If you recall in chapter 1, we've seen the consequences of Israel's sin, their relapse. And what did God do in response to their sin? He brought judgment through famine to Judah. And we've considered the consequences of Elimelech's sin in moving his family to the pagan nation of Moab. And in God's chastening, Elimelech died. And thirdly, we've seen the consequences of his son's sin in breaking God's law and marrying Moabite women. And in God's chastening, his sons died leaving their mother Naomi and wives Ruth and Orpah alone to survive them. And yet after enduring judgment, people in Judah repented and they turned to God. And what did God do? He intervened. He visited his people. He brought rescue and restoration. The Lord called a judge to engage and to deliver. And also specifically, he gave them bread. He gave them bread. Bread returned to to Bethlehem, the house of bread. And remember how this points us to Christ, who is the bread of life. He is the living bread who came down from heaven, born in Bethlehem. Christ came to save his people from their sins and to give us everlasting life. And indeed, he has. And so news of this rescue came to Naomi in Moab. And being well fed and cared for in Moab for the last 10 years, what did Naomi do when she heard this news? Did she tell her daughters-in-laws and friends something like, wow, you know, that's, that's really great. I'm really happy for them in Judah. And do nothing else? No. She rose up, she packed up, and she started to make the trek back home. She knew that God brought the famine, and God lifted the famine. God convicted her, and she knew that Moab wasn't where she was supposed to be. She needed to repent and to return to her God and her people. Really, every conversion involves this process, doesn't it? Leaving and going. Leaving our old life and turning to God. And though Naomi started the trek back with her daughters-in-law in tow, though Naomi loved them dearly, the text tells us that she knew that it would it would be a hard journey, possibly an even harder reception when they arrived, considering even that Ruth and Orpah were Moabites. Naomi Naomi knew that they would have a hard life since they were widows with nothing. The girls needed to count the cost was a big piece of Naomi's message. She had much sadness and grief for she knew that God's hand was against her. And therefore, she knew that their hearts needed to be all in if they were to go with her. And therefore, Naomi encouraged Ruth and Orpah to go back home to their families where they could have good lives and find new husbands and be provided for and protected. If you remember, there was not only discussion, but there was a lot of emotion and weeping. And this leads us to our text this evening, as in verse 14, after a second round of weeping... Orpah kissed Naomi and left. But Ruth clung to her. Now let's look at the commitment and the spiritual state of Orpah in verse 15 and the commitment and spiritual state of Ruth in verses 16 and 17, as well as the Naomi and Ruth's return to Bethlehem at harvest through the rest of the chapter. In verse 15 we read, And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people 
and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. So in Naomi's words to Ruth, in response to Ruth staying with her, she made another, another argument as to why Ruth should return home to her family. And notice this time, Naomi doesn't make the argument from her own situation, her own lack, her own hardship, her being under the discipline of God. No, she argues from the point of Orpah's departure. In essence, Naomi said, See, Orpah finally got it, Ruth, and you should too. Go go after her. That's really the best thing for you. And yet we find Orpah's commitment and heart exposed here. And in many ways, we really find wisdom in Ruth's staying. Orpah was easily persuaded to follow her own corruption. It's important to note that the tears that these three women cried were tears that were shed for different reasons. Orpah regretted that she was walking away from Moab. That's where her heart was. Naomi regretted that she left Judah, that she left her people, the land of promise. Naomi had tears of repentance. Ruth regretted that they hadn't gone to Judah earlier, for God was working in her heart, too. Remember Paul's words to Corinth in 2 Corinthians 7.11. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Orpah's heart was still in Moab. She loved Naomi and had a good beginning with her, but there was nothing in her that had changed. How do we know that this is true? Well, it says that she went back to her people and, importantly, to her gods. She loved Naomi, yet she did not love her well enough to leave her country and her God. She had strong emotion. She cried. She had sorrow. But it was the sorrow of the world. There was no transformation in Orpah, no repentance. Orpah was lost, without hope, without God in the world. And she went back to worship her false gods with her family. And so Orpah's commitment was weak. And she was spiritually dead. You know, there are many today who are like Orpah. They begin well. They have friendships and associations with Christians. They may have even gone to church and sat in the pews for some time, hearing the word and the gospel. And yet they are like those spoken of in Hebrews 6.4 who have at one time been enlightened and have tasted the powers of the world to come, they have some appreciation of Christ, and yet they haven't been saved by him. He isn't their Lord. They aren't willing to forsake all other things for him. And therefore they are willing to walk away because they don't truly love him. Their love and affection is toward other things. That's where their heart is. And now we never hear about Orpah again in Scripture. God's use of her in the narrative is right here in these verses. And this is the lesson that we need to learn and to see with her. But yet Ruth's condition is quite a different story. If you look at verse 16... Look at what Ruth said. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you will go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Wherever you die, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more so if anything but death 
parts you and me. So as Ruth is clinging to Naomi, she is showing herself to be resolute in staying with her and following her. And though Naomi tried to be as persuasive as possible to get Ruth to go, Ruth tells her, don't urge me to leave. Don't do that. Each attempt made Ruth more firm in her stance to stay. Ruth was committed for the long haul. And this is similar to Joshua's words to the people in their resolution to Joshua. In Joshua 24, verses 19 through 21, we read there, But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. And so Ruth told Naomi, Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be mine. Your God will be my God. This is also similar to Jesus' discussion with his disciples in John 6, 64 through 69. He said there, But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will ye also go away and then Simon Peter answered him Lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life and we believe and are sure that you are the Christ the son of the living God some left but the true followers the true believers those whom the Lord had extended grace to and was at work in their hearts and were truly saved, followed him. Where else should we go? Whom else should we follow? You have the words of eternal life. Beloved, Ruth committed herself to be Naomi's lifelong companion. She embraced Israel as her people and the living God as her God. Her words echo the promise of the covenant of grace that God will be our God and we will be his people, as we find in Genesis 17, 7 and 8, where we read, And and I will establish my covenant between you and between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan has an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So in verse 17, we find that that Ruth also swore her commitment in an oath. Sworn in the name of the Lord, as she said, the Lord do so to me. Swearing such an oath in the Lord's name confirmed her allegiance to the Lord as her God. Ruth was so serious that she also swore not to return to her family, to her country, to her way of life. She would die and be buried with Naomi in Judah. You know, what a radical change in the heart of Ruth. She was granted faith and repentance, brought from death to life. She turned from her gods to serve the God of Israel. She was impacted by the word of God and the witness of God. And what witness did she have? Whose witness 
that God used to lead to this change. It was Naomi's witness. Naomi walked away from God and the family of God with her family when they moved to Moab. And now God has turned her from her backsliding to return to him. Naomi was a great sinner, and to be honest, she was a poor model and a poor mentor. If one was to choose a person who was a good witness of obedient Christian living before the Lord, Naomi would be far from the top of the list. And yet even a weak witness of a believer can in the hand of God be used by him in great ways in the life of another. Isn't it true that God can and does use even weak, far from perfect people like you and like me as means of impact in other people's lives? And so Naomi told Ruth to go back and Ruth said no. She would press on in love for her mother-in-law and love for God. So we see in verse 18 that they continue to walk together and put the matter to rest. There was no need to talk about it anymore. And then they arrive in Bethlehem, verse 19 tells us. And how were they received? Remember, Naomi was quite concerned about this. This was one of her arguments as to why they should go. But how were they received? Notice the scripture says the whole city was excited because of them. They had come home. The women, even talking amongst themselves in Naomi's earshot, asked if that was Naomi. And indeed it was. However, Naomi was cut to the heart regarding her sin. And so much so that she even stated she didn't want them to call her Naomi. For she hadn't lived up to her name, so to speak. She hadn't been the pleasing one to God. That's what her name meant, if you remember. Pleasing one. Instead, she wanted to be called Mara. And she wanted to be called Mara because Mara means bitter. And if we were to think for a moment that, oh, it means she wanted to be called Mara because... She was bitter against God. It's actually different than that. She says, For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? Hear Naomi's recognition of God's work in her circumstances. She was empty. That was true. In her flesh, she had much opportunity to be tempted to be bitter against God for his providence, for his chastening. And yet, no. She makes very clear and poignant statements about God's dealing with her. And she knows. She knows that she deserved it because of her sin. So Naomi went out with her husband and her sons, and she went out with possessions, etc. She was happy. She was full. But now she returns empty. Her family is gone. She probably sold her possessions to make a light travel, scholars believe. And by her estimation, she had nothing. And yet in verse 22, in God's good providence, they arrived home at the time of barley harvest. And that's important. Why? Again, thinking about those last two pieces of the cycle. Relapse, judgment, repentance, and rescue. Here we see God come through for her and for Ruth. So they arrived at the time of barley harvest, which meant that there would be plenty of food. Again, we find this cycle true 
God rescues them and provides for their needs through the harvest. We're going to see more of that in the coming verses. But beloved, God's chastening hand is often heavy, isn't it? It can be hard to press on under it sometimes. It's hard to work through conviction and sorrow over our sin. It's hard sometimes to return to God after we've sinned. We repent, but maybe we're so ashamed. We're embarrassed. We're dealing with the consequences of our sin, and we know that they're happening because of what we did, and yet God's saving and restoring grace is greater. God's saving and restoring grace is greater. God called Naomi to do something hard. He drew her to come back home after hefty chastening. There would be hard journey. The daughter-in-law in in tow. Uncertainty galore. And yet she knew that she needed to do it. She knew that she needed to come home. Home is where she needed to be with her people and, and importantly with her Lord. And having been brought to new life, Ruth knew it too. And so they walked step and step together and found God's favor in the people's welcoming and God's provision as they made it home at harvest. It's a great and a wonderful testimony of God's discipline, but of true repentance, of true grace, of God's providence being at work even in the background and undergirding all of it and leading then to see the surface of it and it coming up to the surface in a visible way in rescue. You know, you too may have experienced or are experiencing the weight of heavy chastening or providence. But hear the call today. Repent and return. Repent and return to God, knowing His grace and love to you in Christ. Walk the hard road that He has laid out for you in obedience, trusting and knowing that He will provide for and bless you as you do. Amen. Let's pray together.